So my, my talk today is called, there's the title, it's called Finding the Gift, subtitle, Must Be Present to Win. <laughs> Must be present. Well, that's, that's part of the, that's half the game in our lives, isn't it? Just showing up and being awake in, being present in our moments. Must be present to win. So finding the gift. Now I want to look at some, t some ways this has shown up in my life. Uh, and often, you know, we, we, people say, you know, uh, the challenge is how can you find a gift in anything? And there are many things in our lives that don't look like gifts at all. Isn't that right? There's some things like, I, I don't see any gift in this. So uh, that's, that's the challenge, and we're going to look at that in a minute. But first, I, I like to open with a joke. I have a new joke for you, and uh, hopefully, it's, hopefully it's new to you. So here we go. Um, this, is a, this takes place back in the Middle Ages in a little uh, town square. There's a scaffolding that's been built because uh, uh, three men are set to be executed at the guillotine. So already it's hysterical. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, so the crowd's all gathered, and there's three, three men, and they're going to each go up one by one. And this is a doctor, a lawyer, and an engineer. <laughs> so, true story. And uh, so uh, the doctor goes up first. <clears throat> And as he steps up the steps, the executioner says, well, you do have one choice. Uh, you, you can either do traditional or you can turn around and face the blade. He says, well, okay, I'll face the blade. And he, he puts his head in the block. The executioner reaches up, pulls the rope. Here comes the blade. And just before his neck, it stops. And the whole crowd murmurs, like, what? And the, and the executioner says, well, obviously this is a miracle. The hand of God has saved you, and you are free to go. So... Fantastic. So next is the doc. The was doctor. The lawyer's turn. He steps up and says, "Well, I'll face the blade too." And he puts his head in the block. The executioner pulls the, pulls the rope, pulls it back up. He goes. He pulls it to release it. Again, it stops right before his neck. Another miracle. The crowd murmurs. He's been saved by the hand of God. It's the engineer's turn. Well, I'll face the blade too. And he puts his head in the block. And the guy reaches up. You know, to pull the rope, just before he pulls it, the engineer says, no, wait, wait, oh, no. I think I see the problem. <laughs> so, um, maybe he didn't find the gift in that situation. <laughs> Well, I, uh, one of the things that's, that's uh, shown up for me is I, and I, in my journeys, I've been doing this for 36 years, as, as Linda mentioned, and, um, and one, there was a retreat I was at several years ago, and uh, I get to go to a lot of events where I get to be open, and just, I'm not just singing for people, I get to participate, and <clears throat> this one particular event, I was doing a four-day intensive on a little island off the coast of Sicily, and um, there was a point where I was just so wide open, I, I started to hear a voice, and the voice kept repeating this one phrase. It kept saying, it's all a gift. It's all a gift. It's all a gift. Every single bit of it, it's all a gift. And the, the more I heard the voice, the deeper it got into me, where I could really feel the truth on that statement. It was like I was saying, we don't, there are things in our lives that don't feel like gifts at all, but, but it's, it's, it sounds like this deeper wisdom was saying, no, Everything, there's a gift in everything if we can just see it. And um, it, what it brought to mind for me is, and maybe you feel like this is true, like our higher selves, our higher self is busy bringing us all these lessons for us to learn, for us to grow, for us to stretch our spiritual muscles, you know, to really become more deeply who we are as souls. But meanwhile, our lower self, it's like we've got this ping pong paddle, and, and everything coming at us, we're busy batting away, right? It's like, no, no, no. But no, you're asking for these lessons. Your soul wants this growth. You need this obstacle course to grow. You do. And, you know, I, I did the S training many years ago. Did anyone here do S or you're aware of it? Or, like 1980, I think I was late in the game, 1980. And <clears throat> I remember the, uh, there was a trainer uh, from the stage. One of the, the main things I remember about that weekend 40 years ago, is that uh, um, he stood up there at one point and he looked at the crowd, like 400, 500 people in a big hotel ballroom, and uh, he, he, at the top of his voice, I'm not going to yell that loud, he, he said, 
you need your problems. You need your problems. It's like, what's he talking about? But he's making the same point, really. If you didn't have problems, what would you do? You know, you, we need these ways, these things to overcome, to grow, to stretch, to, to, to give us life. And maybe there's a better way of saying it than you need your problems. I guess you need your challenges, you need your exercise, your spiritual exercises. But um, what it called to mind to me, and I got this image, so let me just, you know, picture this. Like you've decided, let's say you've decided you're going to the movies at the movie theater. And you walk up and you buy your ticket, and then you walk in and you find your seat. And then the movie starts, and then for the next two hours, you're watching this movie. And what if everything went right? What if for the next two hours everything went right? Would that be the most boring movie you ever went to? Who wants to go to that movie? But guess what? This, your life is a movie. It's so, do you want everything to go right all the time? You might for the first week and you go, I don't know. I don't know if this is it. And it's interesting. It's like we need, we need that agitation in a way. To keep solving, keep stretching, keep overcoming, keep figuring stuff out, I guess. So uh, some problems, uh, some, uh, some situations, often you may not find the gift for years or even decades. Have you had that happen where you, like, you look way back and go, oh my God, I finally see why that had to happen. And I, I had a story uh, for me, this is not um, you know, earth shattering, but it was interesting to me, and, and this, this goes all the way back to me in the fifth grade. So imagine me, I'm a 10 year old, and it's, uh, it's the day before Valentine's Day. And our, our group assignment in our class, she says, everyone get out you know, your, your construction paper and scissors and paste and all that, and, and I want you to make a Valentine's card. So each of us you know, made our own little personalized Valentine cards, and we didn't finish that day. So she said, okay, we'll just take them home and finish them at home and bring it back for a grade which is, seems kind of weird, we're getting graded on Valentine's Day, but anyway, so we were. So, so I took my stuff home, and I'm sitting there cutting and pasting, back when that really meant cutting and pasting. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, I, and at a certain point, I thought, well, I haven't written anything in it. Well, I, I kind of wrote four lines, it kind of came quickly, and I, fin I remember finishing, going, oh, it's kind of nice, and then I finished the rest of it, glued it together, and folded it, and we all, the next morning, just set them on her desk. And about five minutes later, after, we, after we'd all come to class and set them on her desk, she came over to my little desk and she said, uh, Charlie, I, I just looked at your card, and, and I'm sorry, but I, I have to give you an F. I can't give you credit. Obviously, you cheated. So, what, what are you talking about? I said, well, I, I read it, and obviously you copied this out of a Hallmark card, and so I can't give you credit. So I did not, I didn't. No, I wrote it myself. It's, so it's, and she would never believe me, she would. Now, I'll admit I was a bit of a rascal, so. Um, but she never believed me. And it, it was just, just another little wound in a kid's heart. And uh, about four years ago, I remember thinking about that, and I went, oh my God, I got the gift. My, my fifth grade teacher was telling me that as a 10 year old, I was already writing at a professional level. Yeah. How about that? Wow, thank you. <laughs> what a difference. But you know, sometimes it takes a long time till we see it. You know, in life, some, we, some little issue happens. We think, I don't like this, but you realize, later, oh, that led to that, and then that led to this, and oh, oh, that all had to, that had to happen. And you find the, the peace on the situation, how it really resolves itself in peace, even though you don't see it when it's starting. So if you are aware of this kind of mechanism, you know, how things are leading to something, maybe take that and apply it to whatever mess you're in this week. <laughs> And, you know, so we've said it forever in unity, claim, claim divine order, that we don't see it, but something is happening for our good. It's all, you know, like we've said, it's all good. The divine, you know, the presence that's always, it's all the all-loving good. Um, you know, there's a phrase you hear a lot when, when uh, catastrophes happen or when something in the news, and it's, it's that phrase, how could God let this happen? You've heard, heard this, you've probably said it. How could God let that happen? And... You know, this almost presupposing God is this white-haired old man up in the sky you know, pulling the strings. And 
I, I think of God as more of a, this uh, loving energy, this, this presence. But the real question is not how could God let this happen, but what am I going to let happen in my heart in response to that? What am I going to, what's the God in me going to let happen? How can I respond to this? You know, if I'm seeing chaos out there, am I going to respond with chaos and just kind of reflect it? Or can I come back to my inner peace, my core, and hold that, hold that truth? You know, because what divine presence is behind everything. Can we tap back into that? Like in the meditation, remembering who we are. I am spirit. Can I always come back to that core when a challenging situation occurs? I want to read a, a phrase from A Course in Miracles. There's another one of the lessons that kind of addresses this. And it's, so when you see chaos out in your world, maybe you'd like to use this phrase. I could see peace instead of this. So imagine something chaotic for a second. I apologize for bringing that up. But, uh, and then, then let's say those words, I could see peace instead of this. Together, I could see peace instead of this. Because peace is behind all of what's going on. There's still that core peace. There's still that presence of God, that Christ self, that, that I am spirit, that we are behind all of this. Can we step back and just reclaim that in the middle of whatsoever, whatever is going on? I could see peace Instead of this, I'm going to read a couple more lines from that lesson. Peace of mind is clearly an internal matter. It must begin with your own thoughts and then extend outward. So if you're starting with chaos here, are you likely to create peace out there? Probably not. It must start with your internal thoughts and extend outward. You, um, it is from your peace of mind that a peaceful perception of the world arises. So let's start here. Remember, keep step coming back. And that's back to uh, finding the gift must be present to win. Must be present in that awareness of who we are, in that Christ self, that spirit self. Uh, another thing that happened to me, um, and this is a good story. Um, you know, I travel around. I'm the one always organizing my, uh, my gigs here, there, and everywhere, all around the country and beyond. And... Um, I was, uh, I had been organizing a trip through Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina about two and a half years ago. And, and these things you have to set up four or five, six months ahead just to work with all the different churches' calendars and plan way ahead. And I had organized this and uh, this one church in South Carolina called me up six days before the gig and canceled. <laughs> and it was like, you can't, my heart said, you can't do that. I planned these things months ahead. And then my whole car trip was organized where the rental car, you know, you pick up, start one place, you kind of want to do a straight line if you can. And, uh, and so it was a, a Wednesday and a Thursday in the middle of the week, you know, a, you know concert one night, workshop the next night. And, and for about a minute, I was out of peace about it all. But I said, well, I'm not going to try and bang their head into making, making them keep me and keep the booking. And... Uh, after about a minute, this inner voice said, well, I guess God wants me somewhere else. Yeah. And it felt true. I wasn't just making, I wasn't trying to think happy thoughts. It was like, well, I guess God wants me somewhere else. I just have to like release to that and let's, let's flow with that. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty good thing to think every now and then. You know, if you've got something like you really wanted something to happen, that might be a good phrase for you too. And, uh, let's say that together. I guess, I guess God wants me somewhere else. Let's do it again. I guess God wants me somewhere else. And the other first service, I, let's do it with the shoulders and the hands. Ready? I guess God wants me somewhere else. So it's a good mantra sometimes, you know? If it doesn't work out, just you know, our idea of how things are supposed to go. So, uh, so I went with that and I thought, well, it's probably, um, I want to book something. It's probably not going to be a church on six days notice. Uh, but I could do living room concerts, you know, house concerts. So I thought, well, there's a friend up in Virginia. I could, uh, I could call her up and see. And, and, uh, and I did. And she booked me for that Tuesday. So great. And then I thought, oh, yeah, but there's a friend up in New Jersey with a house on a lake. And she said she's always wanted to have me do a concert there. So I called her up. She said, yeah, that's great for that Thursday. So suddenly I had some bookings, okay. And uh, I did the Tuesday night concert, and that day I got a text from an old girlfriend uh, I hadn't seen in a couple of years. And she said, uh, said I'm, 
uh, I live near the New Jersey concert. I saw it on Facebook. I, I might be able to come. And oh, great, that'll be nice. And I knew that last time I'd seen her two years earlier. She had a she was in a five year relationship. So well, just friends. And uh, the next night she texts again. Yeah, looks like I'm, I am going to be able to come. I'll see you tomorrow night. Oh, great, that'll be nice. And so uh, that concert finally occurs, and uh, she shows up. And and the minute I saw her, it's like. Boing, my heart. <laughs> and all she was doing was smiling at me, which wasn't helping. And it was like, oh my God. And I discovered at the animation that she, both she and I had been out of any relationship for a year and a half, so we were available. And we haven't let go of each other since. <laughs> yeah. So, I guess God wanted me somewhere else. Thank God I didn't like convince that church down in South Carolina to you know, go with it. God, maybe life's redirecting us. So, uh, well, something fun to say. We met years ago at a Unity Church in Maryland initially. We dated in the early 90s. Uh, we, a few months ago, we celebrated our first wedding anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. And, and later this month, we're celebrating our, our 30th anniversary <laughs> of when we first crossed paths. So we're actually going to go down. We rented a place in Carmel just to just go celebrate, say, wow, 30 years of not really being together. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, I want to tell you another story. That, and this happened uh, when I, I first got involved with Unity. I went to, I was living in Houston. I grew up in Houston, then moved away and lived some places, ended up back there for a while. And, and uh, a friend told me that, that this church, she said, she heard some of the music I'd been writing. I was early on my spiritual journey. And she said, you know, I, I know a place they might really like this music you're writing. Have you ever been to a Unity? And no, no. Well, you ought to check them out. And I walked in the door and it felt like instant community, felt like my people, my tribe. And, and, it, and it really kind of helped usher me into being, uh, performing in front of people. And I remember uh, one Sunday afternoon, I, you know, after church, I was just uh, in my driveway washing my car. And I, I remember I was leaning down doing the hubcaps and just kind of, I guess, thinking about spirituality. Well, I don't remember why, but the, the, uh, this little ditty came into my mind. And it's just a little simple thing. And it's really, it's about being present, staying in touch with who we are. And it just went like this. All the Christ inside me wants is for me to keep in touch. All the Christ inside me wants is for me to keep in touch. And that's so simple, isn't it? It's really about just being present to who we are. And sometimes we lose track and we just come back. It's really about just keep coming back. Isn't that a 12 step thing? Keep coming back. Well, it's keep coming back to who I am, in a way. You know, all the Christ inside me wants is for me to keep in touch. All the Christ inside me wants. Is for me to keep in touch. Do it a couple more times. All the Christ inside me wants is for me to keep in touch. All the Christ inside me wants is for me to keep in touch. And that's a gift we're walking around with all the time. So maybe finding the gift is really just coming back to who we are and bringing that to each moment. All the Christ inside me wants is for me to keep in touch. It's so simple. Sometimes the truth can be so simple. It's like just keep, just to remember to do it. I have one more story for you before I close. And this is, a, this was a, a situation where it's really hard to find the gift. And this has to do with my mom having Alzheimer's. Now she passed away about four and a half years ago. And, but previous to that, uh, over seven and a half years, she did the slow decline into Alzheimer's. And I would visit as often as I could. Um, uh, we, we were able to keep her at home. My dad was able to take care of her up to a point and then brought in other help. Um, and I would visit every four weeks, six weeks, whenever I could squeeze in an extra trip. And uh, they live down in Orange County. I'm in Santa Cruz. Um, and it's like, I remember thinking, about how, well, how can I help or what? Where's the gift in this? And the, that phrase, you know, finding the gift, in a way, it, it's almost a, it's a little bit of like what's in it for me, a little bit. 
And uh, maybe it's, at times it's nice to flip it into what's in it from me. Sometimes finding the gift is finding how can I be a gift to others in a situation. And something I stumbled upon, you know, she was my, the first person that turned me on to music at all. I was eight years old and uh, she'd be playing ukulele around the house on a regular basis. And, and one day I said, hey, can you show me how to do that? And that's really what got me my first time strumming and playing chords and singing and doing, you know, playing music. So she gave me that gift. And what I noticed was, you know, she, here she is in her Alzheimer's situation. And whenever I pick up that ukulele, she still had it. I would play some of those same songs. She would just come alive. She was right there. She was sick. She knew all the words. She was singing, happy, smiling. It's like, hey, there's mom. And it was like, like I found this magic key. It was the music. And, I, and I'd seen that previously on some, uh, there was a YouTube clip someone sent me years ago about that same thing. Maybe you've heard about this. And so I found a way, you know, to be the gift in that situation and to bring some life. And even up to the last time I saw her was three weeks before she passed. And the same thing was happening. Just that I played the uke, I played these old songs. You know, hey, Mr. Banjo, play a tune for me. And it's like, she was right there and loving it. So even in the hardest situations, you know, not what's in it for me, what's in it from me? How can I be a gift? How can I bring a gift into that situation? How can I bring that presence? Just that start from this light here and remind us all who we are. All the Christ inside me wants is for me to keep in touch. Thank you.